pleased to introduce today a speaker who's come back for a second try, Mr. Paul Short. He claims to be a serial entrepreneur and a lifelong New Mexican, a rare commodity, lifelong New Mexican. Got his BSEE and MSEE from NMSU, worked for Honeywell, and then went on to found InnoVasic, which he bootstrapped. Ask him what bootstrap means. To over $1 million in sales. And then he got that growing and received $3.25 million in venture capital, and he grew them to $5 million in revenue during the last economic boom and bust, I gather, right? Mostly bust. Mostly bust. So ask him about that, too. He raised some extra money, hired professional management, and then apparently left, eh? Moved on Moved to on. the next step in the series. Okay, after that he joined the Verge Fund, which is a New Mexico seed stage venture capital fund as entrepreneur in residence. Went on to found Quadric and has been running a consulting firm, writing for Innovation Magazine, and now has started the Startup Catalyst to bring a tech stars like concept to New Mexico. So if you got an idea, catch him later. He's the guy to talk to. So, I introduce Mr. Paul Short, starting up your startup, how to find out if you really have something. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for inviting me. Um, how many of you are technology people, engineers, or scientists lots of you lots of you so I assume that given that's the case that you're swayed by data right if I give you data on something that uh, that you'll be swayed by that um, I'm gonna this just blanket acknowledgments if you want to uh, uh, start start a company uh, here's some great material and I stole all of it I don't have anything original in what I'm about to tell you Four Steps to the Epiphany by Steve Blank. Uh, he's a, an eight-time entrepreneur in Silicon Valley uh, with a, a series of both successes and failures. A terrible writer, but, but it's the best book on startups I've ever read. Ralph Grabowski um, is, another, is on the other coast, MIT, uh, and, and he's uh, written something called, um, uh, he's an engineer, and he's written something called uh, Who is Going to Buy the Darn Thing? Google that. It's an interesting thing. I'll show you what he says. And then a whole lot of other people that uh... All right, so here's some facts. Um, Ralph Grabowski was a, an MIT um, electrical engineer. And he was uh, working on a project that, uh, in, in a company. Uh, and he designed all this stuff, thought it was the greatest thing. And the thing didn't sell. Didn't sell. And he thought, well, what the heck? What's, what's, what's up with that? So, being an engineer, he went and said, I'm going to find out what separates <coughs> successful technology products from unsuccessful technology products. And what he found was, this was shocking to me as an engineer, and I got my I, MS right here in this, in this building. What he found was <coughs> companies that spent more on marketing than on engineering were successful. And those that spend more on engineering than marketing were not. <clears throat> right? so, so again, as an engineer, I looked at that and said, that can't be. Because uh, engineering is clearly more important. But he, he did the study. Look, look at the paper. And, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know, hard, hard to argue with the facts. And furthermore, the interesting thing is, is, so he came up with this marketing to engineering ratio, right? Which is a very engineering thing to do, is to create a ratio. Uh, and that uh, marketing to engineering ratio of greater than one, he says, is, is, is the road to success. And the thing is that, that what's even more surprising is his definition of marketing. And it's not advertising, and it's not promotion, which are very expensive things. <clears throat> it's the stuff that you do up front before you do your product development. 
<clears throat> and I can sum it up in three words and probably leave right now. <clears throat> talk to customers. It's, it's a lot of talking to customers. Right, so so it, as I, I can tell you that many years ago I would have said, well, how do you spend more on marketing than on engineering? What can you possibly, what was the effort that you can possibly do that will cost you that much time and effort? And I'm here to tell you. So, uh, here's another thing, right? The secondary research, the market research that you do behind the computer, Googling stuff is 5%. The primary market research, talking to customers, is 95% of your effort. <clears throat> Again, this is, um, this is based on what I'm about to show you. And this is the first step in, in determining um, uh, whether, whether a company, whether a, pro, a project you're about to do is really worth creating a company over. Is, is the first step in, in um, the four steps to the epiphany by Steve Blank. This is just the first step. The first step to the epiphany. So, go on. All right. This is called, we've called this the opportunity assessment. We do that within the Verge Fund. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, also uh, Epic Ventures, Stephanie Spong of Epic, Epic Ventures was, uh, was helpful in doing this, called the opportunity assessment. Before you go start a company, you want to answer four questions, right? <clears throat> Is there an unmet need? Does anybody care, right? <clears throat> so, it's so unmet need, right? this is, I, I said this uh, the, first, uh, the first lecture gave here. Um, look for something that, that really, makes people kick a chair across the room and say the F word. Like, if you find that within a company, there's a need. It's something that's, that's frustrating. Do you have a solution? So does your technology solve that need? Does it, does it actually solve the need? Does it partially solve the need? That's a different thing. Can you make money doing it? Right? Because if you can't make money, if so what? If the other two are yes, if you can't make money doing it, it's not a business. And the, the last one is what role should you play? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk as much about that, but it's interesting. This cannot be done behind a computer. Right? Again, 95% of the effort is going out and talking to customers. And I'm going to give you a nice engineering process for, uh, about how to do this. You can't farm this out either. You can't hire a marketing guy to go do this. The founding team must do this, so the marketing guy might be part of that. But the entire founding team, including the technology people, have to be part of this effort. It needs to be done, this part, what I'm talking about, needs to be done before writing a business plan. Uh, it's really difficult to raise money. I gave a talk on that at the National Security Technology Conference yesterday. It's really hard to raise money right now. And if you haven't gone and talked to customers and really proven that what you've got is something that customers are going to buy, you're not going to get, you're not going to raise money. It has to be done before that. <clears throat> and it really should be done before doing a lot of product development, not necessarily technology development, but before doing product development. And if, we, if you don't understand that, the difference, let me know. So here's the, here's the process, a nice step-by-step -step process. I'm going to go through some of this. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, that it's, again, it was, this was developed by engineers, essentially, to do marketing. Uh, and, and to do especially the primary <coughs> research. First of all, it's a scientific approach, right? First thing you do in science, you generate hypotheses, right? And it's one of the things I really like about Steve Blank's approach, because one of the things he says is that you have to forget that you know anything. You know nothing, especially about the market. What you have are guesses. You have <clears throat> what you think is right, but until you're, you can predictably sell your product into the market, you can predict quarter by quarter who's going to buy it, how much you're going to make, you know nothing. Right? So get some, get some humility. Um, so start with the hypotheses, and, and I'll, I'll tell you about some of what that is. And the emphasis on the primary market research, talking to customers. <clears throat> this is not a linear process. I, it's, it's not a, a you know, you, you see some, you know, write the business plan, raise money, develop the product, sell, IPO. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> Anybody who's run a business knows that you go around and around in circles. You're going to start with one set of assumptions. You're going to find out that some of them are wrong. You're going to have to go back and revalidate those assumptions. It's an iterative process. Business is an iterative process. 
and and uh, you need to do this before you do a whole lot of uh, expensive uh, engineering effort. So, as I said, first thing you do is is you you document your hypotheses in a nice disprovable style, right? That's a part of science again. You you uh, what you want is a nice bullet list of stuff. Who's what, what's the unmet need? Right? Why why do people care about whatever your product is? Um, if there's if there's no unmet need, there's no business, right? If if you're coming to me with a business plan, and I look at it, so there's no unmet need, there, there's no business. We're going to throw it out. Uh, who's the customer? And here's the here's the big thing that that that's that this piece. You're going to start with one set of assumptions, and it's going to grow and change and morph because because this is something that you have to understand better than anybody else in the world. If you're going to create a business around this, who is the customer <clears throat> within that organization that buys? Whether and, and I'm, I'm talking mostly business to business because that's my my expertise. Um, uh, business to consumer is 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 really no different, but but um, the the buying patterns are both more difficult and, and, and simpler within a business. So if you got a business to business, uh, you have to understand like who who uh, who specs the product. Who uses the product? Who pays for the product? Who approves the product? Who installs the product? It could all be different people, and these are all things that you have to understand. And so you have to write those things down as a, as a hypothesis. The first thing you do is you think, okay, this is what I think the customer looks like. And, and uh, of course, the, the big thing is do, uh, do they have money? <clears throat> One of the things that no venture capitalist likes to see or hear is that there's no competition. And we see that all the time. There's no competition. Baloney. There's always competition. It may not be direct. They may not have something that competes directly with your, your issue. But I guarantee they're solving the problem somehow. They're getting around it somehow. And, and you, have to, you have to, again, get some humility and figure out this is, this is what the competition is. This is how they're solving it now. Uh, because you're going to have to displace them. Okay. Your product is probably the easiest thing because you most likely you're starting with a product idea. Right? So here's the, you know, how does your product solve the problem? And, and here's a biggie, what does the customer have to change in order to use it? I'm going to give you an example of, of, a, of something I worked on for a while. And it was, a, it was an, engineering, uh, an engineering effort. Um, I, I was a chip designer for a, for a while and I had a chip design company. And uh, so after I, after I came out of that, you said, you know, one of the problems is, is that in our, in our simulations, you see big simulations, we're waiting for days, sometimes for days, for those simulations to run. So if I could speed up the simulation by a factor of two to five, then I could, I could have a product there, right? So that was, I had, a, so I had, some, had some hypotheses around that. So... The next thing to do is now you can sit behind the computer and you can start looking at your hypotheses. You, you, you do some Google market research. This is actually, uh, uh, you, and this is 5% of the effort. You want to you go out and you want to look at who, who the competitor is, how big is the market, how fast is it growing. What are the, one of the big things you want to answer is what are, the, what are the fundamental changes that are happening within this industry that are going to gonna force change? on your customers. Customers don't like to change. People don't like to change what they're doing. What is it that's going to force change on them? It's part of the whole unmet need. So you go out and, and, uh, and, and, and you do that. And another good thing to do though is get out, go to conferences, talk to analysts about this. Get, get, get that's beginning to, to actually talk to people. Get out of the office, get out of your cube, and, um, and, and go talk to people. So, so now, again, you go back and you look at some of the, your hypotheses and said, well, or, 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 you know, do I feel like they're still correct or can I add to them? Typically, you'll start adding to them, especially in terms of competition. Uh, and, and uh, well, you can, you can learn a lot about the whole market of competitor websites. Uh, how are they doing things today? So now, the fun begins. Primary market research. This is the most important thing you can do. Okay, and, and you want to get the founding team to do this. This cannot be delegated. The, the decision makers in the company have to do this. 
And here's right, more, more steps. Based on your hypotheses, what you want to do is you begin to generate interview questions. And, and if, if, uh, if you're uncomfortable talking to customers, which some engineers are and some aren't, um, this, is, this is a great way to set up that conversation. You, you, uh, because you have your hypotheses, you can, you can begin to ask questions to prove or disprove those things, right? They're, 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 they're written in a disprovable style. So you generate your interview questions, and then you got to find people to talk to. Who are you going to talk to? Well, you want customers. You want uh, competitors, if you can. If you, can. Uh, you want uh, potential suppliers. You want uh, anybody, in er you know, anybody and everybody around that industry you want to start talking to, but especially potential customers. And then you conduct and document the interview. Okay, so so the 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 um, yeah the, the, I covered covered a bunch of this stuff. Uh, the interview questions are designed to prove or disprove the hypothesis. And here's another thing, right? If you're going B two B, you want to talk to at least fifteen customers, and you probably want at least twice that. Okay? So think about that. You need to talk to a whole bunch of customers. If it goes smoothly, it's fifteen. If you have to go back and change what you're talking about, it's going to be more. You know, because you're gonna you're gonna have to iterate, you have to kind of start all over, and uh, uh, so so you need to start start thinking. If if you don't talk to that many customers, if you have trouble finding that many customers, that tells you something about your market. Right? It's it's too darn small. Um, I, I say also conduct in pairs. Uh, go. It, it's it's fascinating to me when people are talking to to customers. And you have that founding team. You need at least two people in there because people hear different things. I've gone in and said, "Well, you know," and I, I wrote my my notes about the about the uh, the interview, and, and uh, a partner would write their notes about the interview. And there's we heard some different things, so you have to talk about that and and you know what is it that you heard, uh, and it's it, it's it's just interesting. And then and document those results. The way I like to do it is on a wiki. Uh, it just uh, every, every interview, you, you you document what the answers to the questions were, and and I, I've got something in a minute that kind of shows you how to do that. So, and here it is. So this is a, a form you can fill out and, and, and put start begin to put some numerical data down on, on what these uh, what these answers mean. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is talk about what is the customer need. And you want to go out and talk to customers and answer that question, is there a need? And what's the need? And so you have your hypotheses already written down about what the need is. You get a spreadsheet and, and, and you, you, you fill this out with four, maybe five, five max uh, uh, statements in here. And you go and you ask your customer the questions, well, first of all, you know, is, is this a need? How would you weight that? Right? Zero being I don't care. And and five is I need this now. And and I I've seen things like this where, where they're ranked, but the problem with a ranking is you always get a number one. And, and and you can fool yourself into thinking, hey, this is the number one ranked need. But it doesn't mean that it's a that it's a real issue, right? So so essentially what you want is is um one of the ways to ask the questions is, is, you know, okay, is this a need? And, you know, how do you weight these? Okay, where would you start paying? Right? It, it is, is, you know, three, three means that I'll begin to, I'll, I'll pay some money to solve this need. And five is, I'll pay a lot of money to solve this need. Okay, so that, you need to ask, you don't need to ask how much at this point. But you need to, you need to ask, you know, would you be willing to pay to solve that? It's really hard sometimes to ask for uh, ask for money and this is a way to begin that conversation without without mentioning an amount and, and so then once you and then you ask also how is it handled today and you begin to talk about well if you had a solution like this if I had something like this would that solve the problem you begin to talk about the the uh, the solution notice in this that you're not presenting your product you're not selling anything. You're, you're going in and, and all you're doing is interviewing your customer about what their problems are. So why would a customer do that? Right? How do you get in? Well, uh, I, um, I typically uh, appeal to their ego. 
one of the things I like to do is call them up and say, you know, I'm, I'm working on a, on a project that could turn into a company, and I really need to talk to some experts in the field, and I understand you're one of them. Man, you, you call somebody an expert in the field, and they'll carve out 15 minutes of time for you. You know, it, it's, and, and typically it's true because they are an expert within their narrow, it's, it has the advantage of being true, even though you're, you're pandering to their, to their ego. Uh, another way to do it is, 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 to, is to start trading, right? You know, if you give me this, if you give me 15 minutes of your time, I'll also tell you a little bit about what I see as the trends in the industry, right? Because you've already done your secondary market research and, and, uh, and so you've, you've kind of got something to trade. It's some, some overall market knowledge now. And as you conduct more of these, that's going to get better and better and better. And, and if you can do that, then you're, you're, you're beginning to, to develop a relationship with the customer, which is, which is very important in, in the early stage um, uh, <clears throat> development of, a, of your company. So then the next stage is then, uh, because now we, we've, we've got uh, a bunch of, actually, can you go, can you go back? Okay. Um, one of the things you've got now, if you have 15 or 20 customers that you talk to, and, and uh, you've got these weights here, you can begin to, to, to actually get a statistical sample of your customers about, about how, how many of them really have this problem. What are the, what are the most heavily weighted problems? Uh, and and, and uh, so you can actually get a, a nice numerical answer, which I know as, a, as an engineer I love to have that. You know, it's a, it's a, I've got a, a four and a half. It's an average of four and a half. And that's a, that, that's a great thing to have. And so it's, it's a great thing to show to people. It's a great thing to show to VCs. I mean, if you're trying to raise money, so we did these issues and we did these interviews. We interviewed 25 customers and, and 20 of 25 gave us a four or higher on this need with an average of 4.7. Boy, that's a powerful, that's a powerful statement if you're, if you're. It's also a powerful statement to you because something you don't want to do is spend a lot of years on a, on a company that's never going to go anywhere. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a painful thing. I've seen it. I've done it. And, and that's, it's not something that you want to do. Okay. So, so that's the first level of interviews. Now you've gotten and you can go back and you say, okay, is my hypothesis about the need proven? And you've got a number that can tell you, right? If it's, if it's above three you can say, yeah, I, I, I validated that. And if that weight is below three, then you better start doing some other thinking. <clears throat> the next stage then is, is starting to talk about, to find out more about the, co the competition and, and start answering the, uh, the, the sec second question is, does my product solve the need? So what you do is you do another spreadsheet like this. <clears throat> and and you, you start putting not features, but benefits of your product, right? And, and you want to think about what those needs are. And, and the difference is, I'll give you, give you another example. I was working with an entrepreneur who uh, was really proud that, that his product used all off-the-shelf components. Well, I can tell you the customer doesn't care whether it's off-the-shelf. They don't care at all, right? But what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is that it's um, uh, inexpensive and it's available. Right? If, if uh, one of those products is discontinued, it's easy to go in and, and, and replace it. Right? So it's inexpensive and available. Those are benefits. Right? And here's, here's how to describe them. Right? Your price, um, so it's cheaper. Performance, faster, better, higher, bigger, uh, whatever performance means. Return on investment. Right? If, you, if you buy this, within three months you'll get your money back. You'll save enough money. It's kind of a price thing. Um, Packaging, right? That's uh, that, that's a little harder to do, but but uh, you know if it's it's smaller, um, you know, because like uh, you know size, weight, power, sometimes where is 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 a concern in some markets. Um, so anyway, you think about what the what the benefits are to the customer. Why does the customer want to do it? Not not that you know I I've I've got a a, a cool GPU that's that's doing something or or. Uh, uh, I've got, you know, a big screen TV. I, it, you know, the customer doesn't matter what is it that the customer is going to care about. So you put these things in, you do the same thing. You weight them. Uh, and, and, you look at, and you look at your competition and you fill in this thing. 
this and you say, okay, this competition too has, has that. Uh, and, and it may be that that competition is what the customer's just cobbling together today. And you're going to have to continue to, to, to add columns as, that, as, you, as you go out there because you're going to learn more. You know, one of the comments I always get is, well, what about, and they'll tell you about a company you've never heard of, even though you've spent, just spent months researching the thing, and you're going to say, well, then you have to go you know, tell me about them. And you can start filling this in. Again, you want to weight the features. All right? Don't rank them. Weight them. Again, this gives you a, a after you've <coughs> interviewed 25 more customers, it gives you a weight that says this feature or something I pay for. This feature does indeed solve my problem. All right? So if you start getting getting features, especially where you have the the, the benefit and and the cost, the competitors don't and it's weighted high, you start to have something there. Then you can start to get excited. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's numerical, and you can numerically weight them against, against your competition. All right, so easy enough to put a spreadsheet together like this. <clears throat> so here's the thing, you iterate, 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 iterate. You're gonna have to do this oh, a zillion times. And, and uh, uh, so you, at the end of this, you, you've done your needs, you stop and analyze. Are your, are your answers matching your hypotheses? Right? You, you've, you've said the need is this, what's the weight? Right? Is, it, is it a three or below? You better start thinking about it. Right? It, it will the customers pay to solve it? Um, if, if yes, then you can go on. Right? If you've got a, a need that's a, a, a 4.7, um, great, go on and start doing the product research. If maybe, if you're near a three, we'll go back and think about it again. And if it's, if you've got a weight of, you know, zero or one, you need to think about whether or not you want to chase this. And, and uh, as I said, it's a lot better to, to shoot the whole thing than, than, uh, than <coughs> going on and spending years of your life. Again, at the end of the, uh, of the product, right, you've weighted all your benefits, you've looked at the competition, uh, you, you've, you, you've been in customers now and you've been able to ask them, you know, what, uh, you know, what, with, whether they would uh, pay to solve that issue. You, you, can, you can begin to answer those questions. Does your product solve the problem? You've got your weights uh, uh, all, all matched up against your, your needs. Uh, again, right, if, you, if you're getting high, good high weights, go forward. If it's uh, medium, you need to think about it because you need to, uh, a, a startup company needs to have some really strong advantages. And if it's no, you better go back and have a beer and, and, and think hard about it because it's, uh, it's not something you want to do. Okay. So in the end, right, you've got to go back and answer those four questions. And in, in, in what you want to do, go back and, and, and concisely state the following, right, unmet market need. You're answering one of the four questions. What's the unmet market need? You've just talked to, to a bunch of different customers. You should be able to state that very clearly, very concisely, and somewhat numerically. <clears throat> the product definition that meets the need. The competitive advantage, because you've done that, you've, com you've compared everything to your competitors. Um, the exact definition of your customers, because you're going to go to some customers, and you're going to find that they don't care, and other customers do. And you're going to understand then what, what that definition of your customer is. Well, it's, we thought it was both these kinds of companies, but it's not. It's, it's, just, it's just one kind of company. And um, you, can, you begin to answer how you make money, because they've said they've got, you know, that they would pay, pay to, to do that. And then also what the supporting trends are, really what, what, the, uh, what, what are the, the big trends that are, that are uh, changing the, the nature of the industry. If you can do that, you've really got something. Right? If you can do it concisely, you've got something. This is a basis right here for a business plan. And, and I don't care if you, if, if, if you bring something like this, I don't care if it's a formally written business plan. If you bring that to me, <clears throat> five pages worth of stuff written on this, I'm going to be interested. And if you, if you, if you can't answer this, and it's, but it's, you have a beautiful business plan, I don't care. Right? So this is, this is a, a great beginning of a, of a business plan, and it's, it's what I call the customer-validated business plan. 
<clears throat> you've gone out and talked to a number of different customers. You do this, you go to funding source, you're going to be head and shoulders above yeah, just about 98% you know, of, of the business plans out there. This is how you differentiate yourself. If you can't do this, iterate until you can. And I've seen it happen five, six, eight, ten times. I mean, you just iterate and iterate and iterate until you can answer them. Or you know what? There's lots of opportunities. Shoot it and move on. <clears throat> Last but not least, something you need to do. This is going to be a, this is a great exercise to go through to determine whether you're really ready for, or not for this. Actually, can you go back? Uh, one of the one of the uh, my, my friend Stephanie Spong says of, says of this whole process, this looks suspiciously like a lot of hard work, and and it is. It's a lot of hard work. This is where the whole marketing, the engineering budget gets to be above one. Because you've just spent a lot of time and effort doing marketing. And what I've just talked about is marketing. Right? You think about you know, putting up fancy flyers or things like that. That's not mark the marketing that, that's going to make a difference to your company. What I've just talked about is the marketing that's going to make a difference to your company. And you've just spent a huge amount of effort doing that. That's how you spend, that's how you get your ME ratio up above one. Okay. Last but not least, this, this exercise is going to have, have brought you through um, uh, some, some real trials and tribulations. And, and you're going you're gonna to be able to answer some of these questions better. Are you really ready for this? Is this something you really want to do? Is this something you're good at? Um, uh, it, it's, uh, I like to say you need to spend a lot of time with a mirror and look into it and, and see if you're really ready uh, to, to start a company. And if you can answer this yes and you've got that concise statement, you're in good shape. <clears throat> Go for it. I think that's it. Questions? Does this iterative process work with a service or just like a tangible product? It works. It works with the, here's Here's what it, it doesn't work with. It works actually perfectly well with the service, and you want to do this uh, essentially the same thing. There, there are some different, um, it, you still have to have a, a, a tangible unmet need with the service, right? Mm -hmm. if, if they don't have a need for your whatever you're, you're given, then then you still have to, to uh, um, question whether or not it's right. They also, your, your service, your expertise has to fill that need. Right? So, so much of this is still good for a service-based company. Here's what it doesn't work for that well. What, what, um, the, what we like to talk about in the industry is there, there's two different types of risks. I, I like uncertainty better, but risk is the more, more, uh, more common terminology. There's market risk and there's technology risk. Right? Technology risk is, is the risk that the dang thing just won't work. Okay? Market risk is the risk that people don't care and people won't buy it. Right? So it, it doesn't really work with something that's got high technology risk. So anybody can give, give, me, a, give me an example of something that's just got really high technology risk. A nano computer. Nano computer, yeah, because nobody's ever done it. The classic uh, example is pharmaceuticals. Okay, if you've got a pill, right, you've got a, a, a pill that's going to uh, cure breast cancer. It's it's going to have a market. There's not a lot of market risk, but you have to go through the whole FDA process, right? <coughs> this doesn't answer that question. And 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 then there's there's those things that that have both technology risk and and uh, market risk. And I would advise you to stay far away from those because they'll likely fail. But yeah, the, the, the kind of things like a nano nano computer or, or, or a, uh, a quantum quantum computer or something like that, right? The technology's not there yet; it hasn't been proven. Um, it might it might have a market, but you might not be able to to build it. Right? That's the technology risk. Um, and and uh, so so. Um, that, that's really the difference. In, in, my, in my view, service company, this works very well for a service company. You have to modify some of it and some of the questions based on that. Um, but it works well. Anything else? Sir? Yeah, so if you, if you uh, say you're in that marketing space that you described, you just call up somebody? You, I mean, you identify potential companies, customers, and you just 
call them up. Call them up. Yep. That's <laughs> he, here's 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 what I typically try to do is I try to get introduced. All right? You get on your, your Facebook account and, and you start looking at, at all your friends. And and you think, okay, who who do I know that that might know somebody in this company? I try to get introduced. Um, and that that's that's the best way. And and and, and actually there's there's some details in here. Steve Blank uh, says that what you start with are your first friendly contacts. Likely you've got some contacts in the industry. If you don't, uh, that, that's a little odd that you've come up with a solution to a problem in, in, a, in an industry that you have no contacts in. So it's, it's really rare. Typically you'll know a few people. Go talk to those people. And you'll, you know, those are friends you can talk to and you say, you know, I've got this wild ass idea. I don't know if it's going to work. Can you, can you help me with that? And then get those people, once you talk to them, say, who else should I talk to? Can you introduce me to some other people? Um, and then you use that, you know, something like, um, yeah, you, uh, you know, Steve told me that, that, uh, that you were an expert in the field and, and that, that, that I could talk to you. Another thing is that at the, at the end of every one of these interviews, you ask that question, who else should I talk to? And you, you start to, to multiply that. And you're going to, of, some of it is cold calls. And uh, I can tell you the first few cold calls I made, were, those are really hard, um, but I was—I uh, had started a company without doing this, by the way, um, and uh, had no idea what I was doing. And it was either that or starve. So uh, you know, made—I I learned to make cold calls, and, and uh, it's kind of like uh, um, junk mail. You know, you, you get a fairly low hit rate, but that just means you have to call more. Uh, Steve, Steve Blank likes to say that um, every one of the founding team needs to, to, to make at least three phone calls a day and, and then later go out and see at least three customers a day. Of course, he's in Silicon Valley and he can do that in Silicon Valley. Here you might have to travel or, or do more uh, uh, in, a, in a distant manner. Answer your question? Yes. That's hard. It's hard, especially if you're not used to it, it's hard. What else? Yes, sir. I wanted you to go back to your first spreadsheet. I couldn't even imagine how to fill it out. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Where does, where does what go and where does what go and how do I end up with numbers? Okay. So, first of all, you, you've, you've done your hypotheses of what the, what the need is, right? So, so uh, example is... is um, uh, <clears throat> The, you know, the pain point in, in, my, in my example earlier is that engineers are waiting for days for their, for their simulations to run, okay? So the, the need is uh, shorter simulation times, right? You, you, you write that down. And then, um, and then you go out to the customer, so we'll just, we'll just have one. There might be multiple levels of that. Uh, here's another one, right? F FPGA designers at the same time also need, uh, they're spending hours waiting for their layout and route to, to, to complete. And, and so the need is a faster layout and route, um, also faster s synthesis. So there, there's three needs that you, you've identified, right? So now you go out to your customer and, and, and you say, okay, uh, you know, how much time are you spending simulating your, your, your ICs? And they say, well, I don't know, it's a long time, you know, that, that in this I did this. I went to a customer and they said, yeah, uh, post route sim, uh, we can spend uh, five days per corner, five corners, 25 days. Yeah. I said, wow, would you like a faster simulator? And they said, please, God, yes. You know, <laughs> so then you ask them, well, how would you weight that? Is this uh, is not an issue or a critical issue? And they always came up with this. It's a critical issue because I'm, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting 25 days at the end of my design before I can uh, ship to fat, right? And if something goes wrong, power glitch happens, guess what? The 25 clock starts all over. And this always happens at the end of the project when you're already behind and you want to speed it up, right? So yeah, that was, a, that was an absolutely critical need. Right? But, but and, and, and so I asked, right, so then you put the weight in there. You say, what's your weight? Then you write the, the customers, right? Uh, that's a five. 
And then you go to customer two and you ask the same question. And, and oh, that's a three. And, and, and so then you have a whole bunch of these, and you ask these questions too. Well, well how do you do that today? So we just buy faster computers, the fastest computer we can stink and buy, and we load our, our, uh, our simulator on that, and punch the button, and walk away. Right? So that's, that's how they handled it today. And, and uh, so you ask, well, how, how, uh, you know, how, do you, how do you envision this going forward? And they said, well, we're just going to buy the fastest computer every time we do it. Um, and I, you know, then you can say, well, if I could speed that up by a factor of three, you know, would that, you know, by doing this? I said, sure, that'd be great, right? So you write that down. And as you have multiple customers then, then you can begin to average these weights, right? So you go into multiple customers, you ask them, you know, is this a, is this a need? Can you weight that zero to five? They put the number on it. And then as you get 25 of those numbers, you can do whatever statistics you want on that. So did I answer that? And here's something interesting about, about this, too, is because when I originally went out to do this, I had that one need. It was the one need, simulation speed. But then customers kept saying, well, yeah, yeah, that's a problem, but, but uh, it doesn't really help me unless I solve uh, the synthesis and layout and route issue. It's like, oh, there's another need. Right? That wasn't in my hypothesis list. That goes in my hypothesis. The problem is, that I don't have a product to solve that. And if you don't solve all three of these, you don't have a, you don't have a true solution. We can the project, because we didn't have a solution. Okay. So, so asking them this is another thing. When you're, when you're in here doing this, you're asking, well, what have I left out? Right? What, what, what would I have left out, and how would you weight that? Um, and and that's, that's an important one I, I, I should have talked about, because then you, you start learning more about other other unmet needs. I saw a hand raised over here. Yeah. Um, so, what advice would you give a student who is graduating, knows that they want to be an entrepreneur or have their own company in about uh, four or five years? Uh, what advice would you give them while they're get, getting this extra experience in preparing to uh, start their own company? What should they be doing? in addition to getting this experience in their field, and maybe their technical experience? Yeah, um, here's, here's a, that, that's a good question. I've never been asked that before. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I, if I was going to go back and, and give myself advice, um, and I graduated from, from in here, um, I would say, uh, um, yeah, get some of that technical expertise, but, but also, um, make sure you get in front of customers, uh, because because that that's I mean, that's the important thing. Make sure you even if you're doing technical work, make sure you have customer contact so that you learn how to deal with that. Another piece of if you really want to do that, if you really want to get into a startup um, and, and have your own startup, then go work for a startup. That that's I mean there's no better experience. Uh, than, than doing that, and you'll be dragged into. I mean, if you go to, if you go to work for, um, you know, General Dynamics or something like that, uh, they're going to put you in a cube, and you're going to be doing one thing, and, and you're not going to be getting that startup experience. So if you want to, if you want to uh, have your own business, go work for a startup. That that's that's going to be as close as possible to, to what you're doing, because you're going to learn skills that that you know blow you away. It's also a lot more fun, in my opinion, but. It's a, it's a disease, so. <laughs> Anything else? Question? Yes, sir. Um, so what might happen between uh, doing these steps and actually having a business? What do you do after this? Well, um, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, what, you, what you have at this point is a, is a pretty well hammered out business plan. Uh, and, and at this point, then you you can estimate how much money you need, right? For a service-based business, typically you don't need a lot of money to start with, and you, and you can kind of bootstrap that, borrow something from grandma, uh, max out your credit cards. Um, typically, I'd say go get a loan from a bank, but yeah, like they're loaning right now. Uh, so uh, so t you know, with the service-based business, it typically is a lower uh, a lower cost of entry. If it's a product-based business. And you have still have some of that product development to do, and this is this thing is. Uh, can you go to the next one? 
right? Here, you've got, you've got benefits, and somewhere back in here too, you map benefits to features. Um, you've got your product definition. Now you can start doing product development, and, and this will be able to tell you exactly how much that's gonna cost. You need to figure out how you're gonna, how are you gonna finance that. Can you do that on your own? And, and, uh, and uh, you know, is it, is, it, is it relatively cheap? Software, it's gonna be a lot, a lot less expensive than hardware, and some hardware is really you know, un unbelievably expensive, right? So, you know, so it, it might be one answer if it's if it's fifty thousand. Another answer if it's three hundred thousand. A totally different answer if it's ten million. Uh, but to, at least you have a plan, and then you can go figure out how you're gonna how you're gonna get that funded, right? So if you're talking, um, you know, uh, fifty thousand, you can probably figure out how to do that yourself. Um, if you're talking a few hundred grand, angel investors. Uh, if you can, if you can really convince them to do that, uh, um, and then uh, bigger numbers, you're probably talking venture, venture capital. Right? But again, right? If you've done all this, you got a good story. So, um, so then getting, you know, getting funded, that's just the beginning of your troubles. Uh, then, then you actually have to execute, uh, and and so uh, getting a team together, right? Who's going to do it? Is it is it just you? Not if you're raising three million, it's not. Uh, so, so that's a, that's another thing that, that venture capitalists, for instance, look at. And you need to look at yourself too. How are you going to get in? But put put your team together, put your plan together, uh, and then you go out and, and you just execute. Now, if you go out and get Steve Blank's book, right? There are three more steps, and and the next step is actually getting your first order, right? Because you've gotten this, and now you got your product development. And, and, the, and the classic way to do it is, is uh, you, you've got your product develop, your product spec and you make it pretty and you go out to a customer and say, okay, would, would you pay, making out my numbers, would you pay $100,000 for this? And they look at it through and say, yeah, great. Of course, you don't have it yet. Say, great, give us an order. Say, but understand that delivery is a way out, so we'll give you a discount on that delivery, right? Try to get money up front. Try to get money from from a, from a customer up front. You don't lie to them, right? But but you kind of pre-sell. And if you can do that, right, you start start selling to customers full price, um, at, and you know, and then give them a discount because you don't actually have a product yet. Uh, then then that's a real validation of your of your market. That's that's kind of step two of of Steve Blank's process. Uh, step three is 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 uh, building up the uh, the, the real early adopters and, and, and the, the bigger customer base and step four is crossing the chasm if you've ever read that book. So, anything else? Any yeah, questions? Well, if you want to ask, uh, he'll be here yeah. for a little bit. I'll be around while. for a while. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.